Hi, it's John Reed. I'm live from Collision 2016. I'm joined by Mike Jenke from Silent Circle. How are you doing? Good, John. Glad to be here. So we're going to rain on everyone's startup parade in this discussion because you're you're here to talk about security because that's really your background and that's what Silent Circle does. And so all these startups that want to conquer the world, it's like, hey, what about authorization and access? Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's definitely uh, something that rains on the parade of all these young startups. I mean, it's yeah. not even something in their lexicon at this stage. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the iPhone versus the FBI, and then we're going to talk about enterprise security. Uh, but let's just start with with Silent Circle and what your company is all about. Sure. Uh, well, myself, um, Phil Zimmerman, the creator of PGP, Internet Hall of Famer, yep. and uh, John Callis, the creator of Apple's whole disk encryption and uh, also one of the co-founders of PGP. Um, and I started Silent Circle back in 2012. Yeah. And w basically what we do, we're a, a, a Swiss company. Um, we create encrypted communications via software as apps, right. and we're also the creators of Blackphone, the world's very first secure mainstream Android uh, device. Unbreakable by the FBI. <laughs> yeah, you know, here's what I would say. I don't think there's any phone that's unbreakable, yeah, given yeah, yeah, yeah. enough time, resources, and money. Right. Um, but 90% of our customer base is actually enterprise and governments, 10% yeah. being consumers. Yeah, and I want to get into what what those enterprises want from you. Uh, but first, let's let's hit on this whole uh, iPhone FBI uh, debate sure. around encryption. Now, I guess in a way we have a little bit of a standoff at the moment because the FBI did get into this particular phone and such, but there's bigger issues in play, right? I mean, is, is, is the government's sort of, you know, strategy of saying, look, we need backdoors into the devices. Is that the right way to go about this or? It's or the most ridiculous. Okay. Um, no, it, it and they don't truly believe that either. Okay, you can almost see the when they're saying this that that they're they're, um, you know, like a bead of sweat dripping on their eyebrow. Yeah, it, yeah. You would basically tank like that guy in Total Recall in the <laughs> interview. Exactly. Where, right. Is this real or is this not? Exactly. You see that sweat going down. Yeah. Whoever has to read those statements, you yeah. know, is is the 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 last man on or woman on the totem yeah. pool because it, what they're talking about would basically put us back to the 1920s as yeah. far as economy wise yeah so so where do we go from here i mean there's been such a blame game in this debate right because the tech companies are being blamed for putting profit over over safety and the government's being blamed for a poor understanding of encryption technology sure. and, and stifling growth like is there a solution to this or uh, you know i always uh, i always vote for the geeks i think that mm -hmm. innovation um will 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 make it possible uh the reality is there's always been this friction right, right. um and and it and it w wasn't always just in technology it could be in cars yeah. right um it can be in uh camera systems that are required in hotels right. um the reality is government slash law enforcement i'm not just talking the u.s this is a debate happening all over the world yeah um as a swiss firm we deal with a lot of um uh the eu we're not yeah. an EU company, but th they have a lot of these conversations going on as well. And the reality is, uh, the closest I would say to it is the Germans. Mm. Look, Ger German Intel comes out and says, look, we've got a lot of ways to gather intel on the bad guys. Yeah. Breaching private security or privacy and the security of someone's sanctum yeah. isn't required for us. Yeah. So look, you know. German Intel has like one one hundredth of the budget we do. Yeah. And um, they live in harmony with the fact that they have other tools that they can use to find bad guys yeah. without, you know, looking at uh, the nudie pictures that, you know, they need, they require a back door. So it works. We know yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just that we're we're a very we we love division, yeah. especially within politics. Um, what you're seeing is you can put, you know, a date on your calendar every year, the right. FBI. We're going dark. <laughs> we're going dark. GCHQ is great at it as well. you said this has been going on for like decades yeah, now. Yeah, decades. We're, we're going From the dark. 90s, it's, it's, you know, when <laughs> Phil fought uh, to get encryption out, for yeah. God's sakes. Now, every FBI agent's ATM card has encryption because Phil got it out to the world. Yeah. So that's that beat of sweat. It's kind of ridiculous, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, even I think it was even Comey came out and said he put stickers on his uh, on his uh, camera and, and microphone of his of his desktop and his iPad. Yeah. Uh, if it's good enough for him, I think it's good enough for the rest of the world to be secure. Right. 
So you don't necessarily think that that this move in mobile devices like that Apple's sort of spearheaded towards complete end-to-end encryption is necessarily a, a really big game changer. It's not. Look, yeah. there's different types of end-to-end security. Yeah. So if you back up your iPhone, just like every iPhone user in the world does, yeah, they can subpoena Apple and Apple turns it over because even though the text between you and me on iMessage was end secure, right. there's a copy of it backed up on iTunes. Yeah, yeah. This particular issue, and again, they're not trying to break encryption. Yeah, the iCloud, right, yeah. is where a lot of this the stuff iCloud. is. And it's, right, yeah. it exists. The issue is it was the only, it was the employer right. in California that changed the i uh, the iCloud password. Right. It would have been a non-issue. They could have gone to Apple. Apple would have had a turnover, everything. Yeah. So, you know, look, the message gets twisted into whatever political or commercial agenda either side has. Yeah. But it's not a big issue. Yeah. And when, when you think about it, what's really important is real-time threat detection. Correct. And that means making sense of a lot of streaming data. It doesn't necessarily mean access to everyone's data exactly. because you're not going to be able to make any good decisions that would actually help you to identify risk, right? Look, you you think about the fact that where most of these threats are caught from, it's it's both real time and social media. It's real time, you know, uh, immigration. Right. It's um, real time uh, telephone, you know, GPS locations. It's also done hand in hand with law enforcement. Right. So they're they're using analytics that cover all these bases. To be able to tap into your phone real time, if you're on the right. top 100 terrorist watch list, they yeah. can absolutely do it. There'll yeah. be a black van out here that says Fred's Flower Shop on it, yep. and they can put a zero day or set up a fake cell tower. doesn't <laughs> matter. The only thing that would stop that is if you're talking on encrypted communications, yeah. right? But if I'm a bad guy, yeah. look, I can walk down to the CVS and buy a throwaway phone, yeah. and no black van in the world's going to catch me i learned about those from watching the wire there you go you can pick up a bag of them <laughs> sure and you're good how come we don't see the fbi or gchq coming out of ben's uh, throwaway <laughs> phones right come on it's ridiculous so shifting gears to enterprise security that's the focus of one of the talks that you gave yesterday what are you saying about enterprise security and what are your customers asking you about well i, re- I really talk from the standpoint of two things one be in silent circle um, you know, being in enterprises in 140 countries. And the other is my role uh, as one of the founders of a cybersecurity incubator called Data Tribe, where we incubate cybersecurity uh, startups. Yeah. So I, I, from my experience, I, I speak in those, those two, from those two points of reference. One is when you sit down with the CIOs, the CTOs, the CISOs, and the chief compliance officer, i.e. the chief legal officer, who is a big buyer of cybersecurity today because of the liability. They say a couple things. They say, look, we have limited budgets. We have a limited amount of people. So we need to get the most bang for the buck. Um, The key here is your product or service, although it may be great, cannot be additive. So if I've got nine products that I'm running Mm -hmm to quote unquote secure our network, yours may be good, but I, I, I'm already at my capacity. So your product has to come in and replace two or three to right. make it it's better. Where we come in is Silent Circle, we had and have the advantage that there was nothing mm-hmm. in secure communications, right. right? I mean, every day Exxon speaks, does phone calls and conference calls in 41 countries, and all of those are in the clear. They're talking about IP. They are, you know, a conference call where 25 people are on the line. You hear this, beep, 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 It could, who's that? The Chinese military? Is it our competitors? You don't know. Yeah. So secure comms was an area that heretofore had not been addressed. So for us, it was very much a greenfield space. We weren't yeah. additive. There just wasn't anything like it. Right. But over the years, being a vendor to these, you know, Fortune 1000 companies, you sit down and you kind of become kind of a, a digital priest to them, where through the relationship, they talk about the pain points they have. Over the last three, 
the chief legal officer and a chief compliance officer has stepped up to be one of the main buyers or mm. influencers of what's bought um, simply because of the liability. Right? And what are those three pain points So, uh, the, or the big ones you're The seeing? big pain points we see today are, yes, endpoints. And a phone or a tablet is an endpoint, right? Right. So or BYOD. The, or, or the wearable or the whatever wearable it might be. wearable yeah. or a, a, a new Wi-Fi hub popping yeah. up. Um, it, they're happening so quickly. Yeah. Those are a big issue. BYOD is still a big issue. Right. Um, the second one we see is analytics. Right. Right. Look, uh, if you're selling me FireEye, FireEye has its analytics dashboard. If I'm using Palo Alto Networks, it has its dashboard. And right. then I have good security for the email. It has its – how many damn dashboards can the security people monitor? Right. There isn't a real – conglomeration going on that pulls all these products into one good dashboard right. that you can use. So that's an issue, right? Yeah. Um, and the only way it's solved today in an enterprise is to have five or six people, IT security people who are monitoring different parts of the network. Um, right. And then the third one uh, uh, that we're seeing is scale. Yeah. So they are moving to the cloud. Everything's moving to the cloud. So they can tear out a lot of this metal. Yeah. But one of the reasons they're not just moving to the cloud is because of ease. It's also because of liability. Right. So think about it in this terms. You're the chief legal officer of Exxon, and I'm the CIO. Today, if there's a breach, you and I are standing on the red carpet to the board and our job's on the line. Yeah. But guess what? If I outsource a lot of what we're doing to Microsoft, Google, in, or Amazon into the cloud, hey, it, if Amazon gets breached, that wasn't you or I, right? We're right. in the cloud. So there's some That's of this liability. That's an interesting twist on that because we, we thought that there might be hesitancy around the cloud for other reasons, but now you see, yeah, it, you're, you are shifting accountability in yes. an interesting way. Yeah. And, and we see a lot of the hybrids, right? So all your golden nuggets of IP may be kept on, you know, some internal on-site. Right. But a lot of the esoteric everyday functions in the cloud. Where employees can slap it on their USB and take it out the door. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Very safe. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's always a threat, even to the cloud. Yeah. But a lot of these cybersecurity companies, they don't understand. In order to be successful in cybersecurity, yeah. you have to understand uh, your area of environment. And when you can understand what motivates and, and, and the people who actually buy it, such as liability, you, you begin to have a better understanding, right? And look, yeah. if you're a cloud security startup, please, come on. It's like, how many more dating apps do we need? That right. battle has been won. Look, right. there's Google, there's Microsoft, there's AWS, there's Apple, there's IBM, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's EMC. Uh, you know, trying to compete on that scale uh, the, the the good ones have already been bought up and implemented as security solutions there. Yeah. When you said dating apps, I was thinking Tinder for a sec. But right. I think you meant something different. It, it could be Tinder. But yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, uh, yeah. there are startups even out here in yeah, this yeah, hall yeah, yeah. that are, are in the, the da dating game. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I often try to talk with entrepreneurs and say, look, don't be me too. So, and, right. and in cyber as well. Look, you and I may have a great idea. We're really smart guys for a product. But if our product is only 10% better than the other 18 that are out on the market, very well funded and sold, we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. The amount of advantage we need to bring in our software has to be 2, 3x. Yeah. Yeah. So you laid out the pain points, I think, really well. How do companies start to move beyond those into a uh, obviously, you know, security is never done, right? Yeah. And you, you can never relax and say we're good. But how do you start moving into a sensible way of approaching this that that covers risk to a point, but then allows you to take the risk you need to yeah. take? Yeah, that's know? a great that's a great question. Well, uh, a, a lot of it, a lot of the pain points that we see is also due to, to money, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're Disney or Exxon, you know, you don't have an unlimited budget. So yeah. you can't every year be ripping out stuff and upgrading to the newest, greatest stuff that comes no. out. So that means legacy 
is a huge pain point in right. every company. Now, if you're and a you media see that with business, your, you see, consumers see that with their flash player, absolutely. right? Like, like every, like even if it's three days old, suddenly you're exactly. vulnerable. Exactly. And in a leg, in a legacy standpoint, in an enterprise situation, it's really dangerous to have old software that has huge absolutely. holes in it. Not just old software, old hardware. Yeah, old hardware too. Think right? about yeah. think about routers right. or Wi Fi endpoints. Yeah, those things. I mean, if it, nowadays, if you're not upgrading them every week, there's vulnerabilities. Yeah. And it's, you know, Cisco and them aren't p exactly pushing out, you know, fixes every day for this yeah, stuff. Yeah. So you're a victim of legacy no matter who you are. And there is no such thing as 100 percent security. The, the arms race is never won. Yeah. So what what the enterprises look at is they say, what can I do? to mitigate the big threats, right? right? And that's really the conversation they have. It's one of realism. Yeah. Um, and that's that's really where cybersecurity is headed. Yeah. You know you're going to be breached. Everybody's going to be breached. How do you maybe sandbox those breaches so you mitigate right. the size of the damage? Now we're back to the Titanic, right? Correct. If only, if only the first hold had held, you know? Right. Then the ship's You're still running. You're absolutely right. You know? in, 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 in my career in the SEAL teams, we called that concentric rings of security. Right. Right? You know, obviously, your your bleeding edge is going to get breached. Yeah. Um, but what do you have in place to ensure you can stop it from taking the family jewels, you know, of, of the company's IP? That's a sobering but sensible way of thinking about it, right? Like, yeah, you are going to get breached, yeah. but how do you... How do you contain it? It's exactly. A smart, smart way to go. You, you know, the other interesting piece that I've been looking at from a UX design standpoint is how do you balance security with user experience? Because companies can go overboard in a way that alienates users as well. And part of the problem is that passwords are just becoming so difficult to manage. Oh, God, and, yeah. But, but then you also run into things like like in my Quicken software, for example, Intuit has started doing this verification thing every time I load the software. And they're like, let's verify verify for your safety and i'm yeah. like well this is only on one computer and it's in my house right. like there should be a way for me to override that you know yeah i so mean that's a great point i mean it's it's a really really good point look two-factor authentication is great but now everywhere i go I, i've got you know f 15 texts i need to plug in this two-factor yeah. authentication um I, I believe technology is is in the next uh, 24 to 36 months will catch that, though. Yeah. Where they're at now with biometrics, eye recognition, right. and stuff like that, that's going to overtake Unique it. Unique characteristics. But it's can, still an yeah. issue. It's yeah, a big, yeah. big issue. Um, I, I was a uh, mentor in a startup yesterday that's got a very, very interesting novel approach, right? And they're working with IBM and a few others. But you're right, usability. Look, the first... You know, beta uh, we came out with with Silent Circle with our first apps in 2012 was horror bad. You yeah. know, it was by <laughs> cryptographers for cryptographers, right? Yeah. You know, uh, just absolutely horrible UI UX. And then over time, you know, you develop that. The other issue is, you know, people working within the security department of a company don't have time to right. work with complicated UXs. Yeah. Uh, the 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 user experience. You know, look, as the, the a security guy, you need to be able to get a, a, a notification on your Apple Watch that right. there's an alert, yeah, right? Yeah, you you yeah. don't have time to log in, you don't. facial recognition. It has to be real-time stuff. Um, so that's that's another advantage that some cyber startups can have, and, and it's also a pain point for not only consumers but, you know, enterprise. Yeah, it, it will be interesting to see if that can be mitigated through some of those other techniques because – like I talk with startups here and I talk with a bunch of them in the last few days and not a single one of them except for one brought up the security issues of their product because they're focused so much on UX. They're in the opposite direction, right? Where they haven't thought about, well, how do I think about security and authorization? It's like, it's not even part of their method. It seems a lot of times, you know, Oh and yeah, that's a huge issue. Um, and it's also an economic issue. So yeah. if you think about, that um, I believe it's 96% of the apps on the app stores are free. Yeah. And in return for that being free, it's getting all your data. Um, so there's a, there's a multi-trillion dollar economy behind you as the product. Your data is the product, not you, right? Yeah. So if you see a lot of these startups even here, they've got fashion apps. They've got you know apps for your running, your workout, for 
social apps for you know restaurant review apps well those apps are free but how they make money is they get right. your data and the amount of data they get from you is astounding yeah. yeah so you know security kind of flies in the face of right you know the, look if what what if facebook came out and said well we're going we don't want your data yeah, right. they wouldn't exist they they exist because they're able to sell to ad companies your data you know mike I don't, i'm not sure if what is scarier some of my friends that don't even care about the data they're giving away or the fact that someone like me who's cognizant of the risks yeah. participates in these things anyway like facebook right? sure so sure. even though i'm cognizant well, of you're them, making a conscious I'm, decision yeah, yeah. Uh, on some things some things you won't right yeah yeah and it's one of those things once it's seen it can't be unseen yeah right like i i i'm maybe overly paranoid but um and and that stops me from enjoying the use of some of the amazing technology today. Right. But on the other hand, you'd be surprised. I have a 15 year old daughter named Isabella that, um, uh, you know, even in her circle, they're pretty savvy about yeah. these things. I mean, look, if they have a preference between Instagram and Snapchat, they're going to Snapchat. You know why they can, they can delete it. They can have a timer on it. Well, I wonder if women, young women, are ahead of the game a little bit on this, just because they have to deal with oh, sure. more the being the, on the receiving end of sort of that kind of unwelcome sort of stalking of, of and stuff. They are, like, and you're trying to figure out how that person figured that out about me. And yeah, you know, one of the things I've seen both in Europe and the U.S. is you're absolutely right. The the young the young gals, um, up until about ten, it's just free sharing. You know, don't think about it. Yeah, but come eleven, twelve in that age they are opting to move to a platform that gives them a little more control. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's one of the big differences you see between Instagram and say the Snapchats, right? There's a very kind of a cognizant guys like us, you know, I mean, if you have kids, right. We're, we're, we're immature till we're 40, I think. Right. Yeah. The, the women are At always best. way ahead of us. Yeah. At best. I'm 48 and I'm not sure I've, I've reached that right. one yet. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a very interesting kind of demographic shift that I see um, uh, in in the teenagers today. And and they're pretty good by the time they're 15, 16 of making that convenience versus what I'm willing to share a trade off. Um, you know, and, and, and that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. Um, the other thing is, you know, we we haven't even gotten into IOT, which is, you know, right. unfettered access to your whole life right. that isn't being addressed. You know, how many gallons of milk you drink a week? <laughs> well, wasn't there at least one thing that came out about, I think it might have been Samsung, but I don't want to trash them if I'm wrong. But there was like a TV that oh, was yeah. a TV that was actually recording some of the yeah, yeah, yeah. things going on in the room. And Several stuff. of them. Like, I think it was LG yeah. and Samsung yeah. where, you know, here, <laughs> click here to agree. Right. Yeah. Or you can go on to our site and read the 600 page right. agreement on what you agreed <laughs> to. And, and at any time it can record, you know, sound and video from what's going on in your living room up to their servers. Then you're like, what? You know, um, before we wrap, we should wrap in a sec. You and I both have meetings, but um, you're the first Navy SEAL I've interviewed in a while or former Navy SEAL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if that has influenced your career in certain ways, because I'm thinking about how you must have been in a lot of intense situations where you were you were evaluating like risk but then you also knew you had to take a risk sure you know so it's like you had to weigh both sides of that you yeah. couldn't just play it safe and and go for most risk protection because that's you exactly to, right there's a balance yeah tell um, us, can you tell you, us a story be, about something like that you'd be shocked at how many former special operations guys yeah. Uh, are in technology and and entrepreneurship simply because you don't have the same view of risk. Yeah. Right. Risk to me is not the exact same as most people. I, uh, you know, nobody's shooting at me. I'm eating good meals. I get a good yeah. hotel to sleep in. So this is fun. Were you ever in a situation as a SEAL where you had to make a split second decision about always, risk? <laughs> always um, that that always happens. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think, you know, this is why tech 
I hate to make that comparison, but tech is a lot like that, you know? Yeah. Um, specifically when you're older, an older entrepreneur that has mortgages and mouths to feed and, yeah. you know, family and stuff like that. Hey, I'm all in. Let's put our family savings into this. And, you know, it's a great idea. Let's build it. They'll come. But uh, I, I see, you know, in really great, really good entrepreneurs, the ability to um, uh, not allow overthinking something, over securing something, right. hold them back. And, and that's the beauty of what you see with these startups here today and, and a lot of these. But in the SEAL teams, you know, um, you view things a, a lot differently. So I liken it to, I guess the best example I could give you, let's say I had a, a measuring stick here, right? Uh, I view all of us as humans have our own measuring stick. Right. So there are tick marks for things that have happened in your life, death yeah. of a loved one, you know, financial issues, um, health problems, and, and there are marks that go up how high that affects you on your life. Right. In the SEAL teams, you, <laughs> you blow past that, right? <laughs> so right. your measuring stick for bad shit that happens <laughs> is way high. So when you're out of it and you're in everyday life, you go, ah, okay, the car crashed, all right. right. Um, yeah, so our company failed. I missed a client meeting because right. I overslept. Yeah. Go back to bed. <laughs> right. You know, oh, the engineering, yeah. the the beta thing failed at the end yeah. of the world. Nah, let's go get a beer. Right. Right. So that's why I see a lot of those experiences able to help me to to kind of look at things yeah. different. Right. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's the closest si uh, assimilation I can make. The, yeah. between the two. Well, that's a good note to end on. Thanks for your time and good luck with the rest of the show. Hey, pleasure to be here, John, yeah, as always. Thanks, Take brother. Care.